What's good, everybody, man? It's Big Game James, my dog, DDP. Look at him sipping on his drink. You know what I'm saying? From the Dallas Prospect, we here again. You know how we do, man. We talking Mavericks. We talking Cowboys. We talking all those good things. First, you know we always going to start off with the Mavericks. Going to yep. talk about my Cowboys because, you know, I'm heading down to training camp, DDP, and I'm going to be out there like the first week of August. So, you know, I'm going to get all that good film, all that good stuff. So we're going to jump in my mind a little bit and get my thoughts before we head to camp. But yeah. you know what? Mavs is still in the in the air. Jalen Brunson has been really big in the air. And uh, are the Mavs locking them up or the Mavs going to do anything else. You feel me, big dog? I need to know because I looked at a little bit of stuff, but you gave me some in-depth detail, intel about it. Mm -hmm. Kind of let me know what's going on with that, uh, big dog. Yeah, the the Jalen Brunson situation is interesting. Like we've seen any number of reports essentially saying anything from, hey, he's already kind of told current and former teammates. And when I hear former teammates, I'm thinking like guys he played with, uh, previous years with the Mavericks, but also even guys he played with at Villanueva, obviously, or I said Villanueva, Charlie Villanueva. Huh? <laughs> I was like, wait a minute. Maverick, great flamethrower, Charlie Villanueva, Villanova. I, I, I could see where you did it. Cause I yeah. felt you when you did it. So all good. Charlie Villanova. Yeah, yeah. I mean, yeah, it's good. For, that works perfect. <laughs> for, the, for the record, this is cream soda, not beer, but no one's going to believe oh, me but, now. Hey, nobody. Yeah. yeah he li- um, he on air. He lying. He lying. Yeah. 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 <laughs> but uh, yeah, including former Villanova teammates, um, basically that it's a done deal, him coming back to Dallas. And I, I'm 99.9% certain of it. Like I know he shit ain't going has gone, nowhere, dog. Yeah. You feel me? Yeah. I like, I know shit has gone south in the sideway uh, in the past. Like somebody brought up like, well, DeAndre Jordan, uh, you know, went back on his agreement. I'm like, first of all, DeAndre he Jordan a player. Right right, 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 right. But like, yeah, more than, more than that, not just that he wasn't a player for Dallas and it's literally the polar opposite situation. But in that comparison, he was leaving. He was Jalen Brunson leaving Dallas to go elsewhere to be something he had never been before and wasn't probably capable of being. No disrespect to Jalen with the prospect of New York, but it's just like it's not the same. It's it's not at all the fit. And Dallas in 2015, they ended up cobbling together an interesting or no 2015. So that was after the second go around with Tyson. That next team, the best thing they put together was Harrison Barnes, mm-hmm. only because Kevin Durant <laughs> goes right. uh, goes to Golden State. So right. it's like, yeah, it's not at all the same. Dallas was nowhere near a contender, whereas the Clippers still at least entertain the idea that they might be capable of doing something. So it's it's not remotely the same. But I mean, here's the thing with Brunson in New York that I look at. I know New York's trying to clear out twenty five million dollars. Uh, and cap space for him. Hey, that's great. I know they hired his dad as an assistant coach. Hey, that's great. One, I don't think he wants to go play for his dad. Two, the the other two predominant players for them, their other two primary players are both ball dominant, meaning he's going to have to be like the third option here in Dallas. He's number two and he knows his fit here. Sometimes you can fit somewhere and you think like, oh, well, maybe the grass can be greener elsewhere. You don't know how you're going to be utilized there. You don't know how you're going to fit there. Plus, the New York audience, they're going to tear him apart. It doesn't matter even if he goes there and he performs better than he did last year with Dallas. If New York sucks, he's going to be saddled with the blame because they're going to look at him and be like, oh, we spent all this money on Jalen Brunson and all he's putting up is hollow stats. He's not getting us into the playoffs. He's not doing all this shit. Like That's how they're going to look at it. It doesn't do Jalen any good to go to New York. Like he has won everywhere he's ever been multiple times state champion in high school, multiple time uh, national champion in college player of the year. Now he's finally with a Mavericks team that's contending in which he has evolved into the second best player of a deep playoff run team. Why would he leave potentially for uh, a f- what? Like three or $4 million more per year with New York. And by the way, that's, if Dallas for some reason was just like, mm, what if you took like 23 or 24 or 22 or 23 million per year instead of 25 Dallas has already said, and we know they have the ability to give him more than anyone else. It's not a conversation. If Dallas wants to pay him, they can give him uh, they can give him basically a max if they wanted to. I wouldn't, 
but they could give him easily more they than a four for 25 home max no yeah. i know i'm just saying like right, right right new york can give him four for 25 dallas can easily beat that if they want to and i think that they would be willing to so it's just like it to me it's a non-starter there there's no discussion no discussion he likes this team he likes luca there's no reason for him to be like nah man i want to go do it myself or i want to have this thing built around me that just doesn't fit I mean, you just said it's uh, in 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 the in your deep al- analytical terms as you do it, and I has I love it. I'm gonna break it down in my terms. Hail to the no, you <laughs> dumb if you leave. Okay, yep. Jalen Brunson, you dumb as hell if you leave the Dallas Mavericks where you just turned all the way up. People knew about you, but Rick Carlisle was kind of hating on you. But then guess what? Jason Kidd kind of let you do your thing. You turned all the way up against Utah. Why would you leave? See, that's the problem with these players in, in, in these sports things. Now, I'm going to tell you one little thing that Mario Edwards told me. I interviewed him, corn, former cornerback with Dallas Cowboys. He's a coach now. He told me when he was getting ready, coming up for free agency, he said he had a talk with Bill Parcells. And Bill Parcells said, look, I'm going to give you this number, and this is what it is. He said, I know it's not what you want. He said, but you're going to see all the money. Mm-hmm. And you're going to be happy here. And then Mario told me, he said, you know what, coach? I love you. But what you talking about, that's what third, third, third. Um, I mean, um, the uh, slot string? corners make. No, oh, yeah, third, yeah, slot, third corner. slot corners make. So I, I can't do that. So I'm going to go ahead and, you know, test my luck. So he ended up going to Tampa Bay. And mm-hmm. he told me he made a mistake because he said he, Bill Parcells was right. He said because within a year and a half, he got cut at Tampa Bay. He didn't see the money that they had signed him for. Right. He didn't see all that money through and then end up basically pretty much being done with the NFL after that. Well, NFL's, so, yeah, NFL's a little different, though. Just I know, guaranteed I know, money. You have to I almost look at two different, different figures and contracts. Yeah, it's a little different. But the whole point of it is that he went out there and said, hey, I feel you. But I'm going to go ahead and I need to get my money, coach. I need to get my money. And this guy, that would be the situation where, let's say, if Dallas doesn't match, we said, I got to get my money. The situation is not good in New York compared to Dallas. Not close. The situation is not close. Why would you leave stability for instability, especially your role? You're going to a coach you don't know. You're going to a role. It's almost like a job, DDP. Yeah. If you're feeling good at your job, right? Mm-hmm. Might be this job over there. It might pay a little more, but you don't know the people. You don't know the boss. You don't know any of them. Your job here might make it just a teeny bit less, but I feel good here. Every day I wake up, I go to work, I feel happy. I, yep. I feel comfortable. And I like that. You don't always have to jump out there and get the more money. So, Jaden Brunson, if you turn on this show and this podcast, you listen to us. And you stay in Dallas because it's your best option and you can make this thing great with Luca. They just got wood. Who knows what else they're going to do? Because I know you said, are we done? But you never know. This right. is the best situation for Jalen Brunson. And he just need to go ahead and stay. And I think he will. I think he understands it too. No, absolutely. I mean, you, you can interview somewhere for a job and you can have everything sound great. Like, oh yeah, this sounds like a real fit. They, they envision my role the same way that I do. But then like, once you're actually on the so job, you got hired. suddenly you're kind of looking at like, okay, this is a very different oh, side yeah. than what I saw in the interview. Yeah. I've, I've, I've had that happen. Yeah. <laughs> so I, have I. I've had that where you're like going through the interview and you're like, man, this is great. This is going to be a good fit. Get there and then, be like, I hate you know, this place. Two weeks in, you're like, man, this wow. is a toxic ass environment. Exactly. This is not yep. good. This is not yep. a place that I want to hang around. You're like looking at like, all right, well, can you I make call it your six friends months? Can from I make your old job? Yeah. Like, hey, how yeah. y'all yeah. doing over there? What's up? Oh, man, we kick it. Yeah. We kick it and having a good time how's it over there i mean you know you know we having a good time you know just working yep. hard i miss it but i want to go back <laughs> yeah for sure it's uh it's very much grass not always greener sometimes it is mm-hmm. in this case when you're talking about like we're not it's not even like we're talking about like comparing green grass versus dead yellow grass or anything like right, that we're right. we're talking about like the slightest shades of green and it's just like, dude, just wait for the sun to pass over. You know, the sun passes over. You're like, oh, no, this side's actually greener. Like, just just give it a minute. Let it sit for a minute and uh, you'll, you'll see it for what it is. But 
Yeah, I, I don't see a scenario wherein he goes to New York. It's cute. It's because they're the Knicks, right? It's mm-hmm. cute that everyone's talking about it like it's going to be a thing. We hear every big name player seemingly every year linked to who? The Lakers, the Knicks. Uh, right. What's another? Is there a, Miami lately has been a popular one, always linked to people. Those are what we always hear. Miami's not a big market, but it's that's that's the constant every year every right, big right. name notable player is linked to those teams and two of those three i understand the knicks i don't it's just because it's new york that's it so yeah brunson i don't i don't see it they would have if they brought him on three left-handed starters that's interesting <laughs> um and his role wouldn't be the same here right. he's got a much better role so with uh with that being the case and you know to sort of piggyback off of this he was on um, Duncan Robinson's podcast and he doesn't outright say it to be clear. He does not outright say like, nah, New York doesn't make sense, but, but he, out, but he says it. And yeah. And, and, and people we, in real life terms, we heard you say it. You didn't say it. Right. But you said it. Right. No, ab- absolutely. He, he's basically just like, you know, I've won everywhere I've been, which I was saying earlier, I've won everywhere I've been. Uh, I'm not, I'm not wanting to, to go somewhere just because I can make the most money. I want to compete. I want to actually want to do something. Yes. And as we said, New York's best year that they've had in five, six, seven years. I mean, I know they had like one team that had like Tyson Carmelo and um, Amari that got like, home court and advantage and, in the and, first and, round and, and, did they win a playoff even, series yeah and even then nobody was looking at them like oh the no. new york knicks you know what i'm saying right. they, listen jalen brunson if you go to new york we'll never hear from you again pretty much and like i said those fans <laughs> will turn on you i mean shit they uh how fast did now to be fair i understand he's drifted around and he's not been able to stick anywhere but how fast did they turn on the project of dennis smith jr like, I get it. Dennis, he's he struggled to find his Can way. Can we get he, him back? I've been wanting that for a couple of years. I don't think it's going to happen. Wrong? What's I, wrong I really it thought it now? might happen after Rick was gone. I thought it might happen after Rick left, but he was well, with what's Portland. Wrong with it? I, I don't know his current situation at this point. I know he was with Portland for part of last mm-hmm. year, and at some point he got cut. Um, I, don't, I don't know, but he... New York kind of ruined him. Like he was already struggling a little bit with Dallas. We can Rick bring had, him back, DDP. Rick had bring- totally given up on him. Um, but New York, it's like, dude, what did they like? They weren't in any kind of position where they w- could justify not trying to develop a young player. That's that's just the fact. Like when you look at where they were, they should have still been saying, okay, even if we don't think he can be a superstar, we should work to develop him. And instead, every time he touched the floor, they were mercilessly booing him. I'm like, he's on a rookie deal. You act like you're paying him $30 million to stink. Right. Like it, it's just a, it's a terrible fan base. Honestly, like I get it. Dennis Smith didn't pan out. We thought he was going to be a lot better. I'm convinced had circumstances been different and he never left Dallas, he probably would have been better, but under Rick, maybe that's really debatable, you know? So it's uh, it is what it is, but New York but coming not... under kid though. Here's my thing. If Jason Kidd could get him though, yeah, in a backup role and really build up his confidence back together and build him back together mm-hmm. in Dallas. A lot of people in Dallas loved him. And I feel like that would give him confidence to play better because we loved Dennis Smith jr. Mm-hmm. When a lot of us weren't were mad when Dennis Smith Jr. Remember when me and you talked and I said as soon as he got there, I said it's not gonna work because mm-hmm. I know how Carlisle is and Luca's gonna take over, and I know it wasn't gonna work. But now in the situation that you have it where we already understand who is the star now, yeah. Now this is a situation where Dennis Smith Jr., you should be able to accept a backup role because you've been tossed around the league like nothing. Yeah. So now I would from feel New York like you, to Boston to Portland. Me? And now I don't know where he is. Right. So my thing would be you would embrace it. The fans are going to embrace you. You're still young. You can add a great element to He's the He's still team tight with Luca, too. Home. That's what I'm saying, man. Mm-hmm. That athleticism, that could be a great pickup, and he ain't going to cost no money. Yeah. No, think of it this way. Um, he basically, because 
the Christian Wood trade opened up three roster spots, he basically would be filling the Trey Burke role. Trey Burke role. And that's Burke barely played for Dallas. Yeah. And uh, to be clear, like, I think he could play more minutes, obviously, than Burke did. But my point is, like, if you want a a guy that can be a a scorer and a slasher off the bench, there you go. You can get Dennis Smith Jr. and have a guy that's still an athletic freak as well. So I... I've heard nothing of it, nothing hinting toward it. I don't know his even circumstances of his current contract or if he's in the league officially. I'm putting it on Twitter to, tonight, DDP, and I'm pushing the it. hell out of it from out yeah. of there. I'm pushing the hell. I'm tagging Mavericks. I'm tagging you, Mavericks. <laughs> Y'all tagging you, Mavericks. Get ready, Mavericks, because Dennis Smith Jr. getting tagged on your your thing for about at least three days. Yeah. 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 Uh, he even hinted in the past that he would be interested in joining Dallas at some point again after – and it was insinuated like once Rick was gone, mm-hmm. would he be interested? And he even kind of like Jason quote tweeted it. And this was even before kid was hired. In fact, right, I don't right. even know if I'm Rick had saying. been fired yet, but right. he was like quote tweeting it basically suggesting like, yeah, like I, I would be interested in coming back to Dallas, but yeah, that, so that's not the mid-level exception. Well, hold on. Let, let's wrap up the Jalen thing here on the podcast. So basically said not interested in uh, taking the most money just to go somewhere and um, not compete. That's not how he's built. And if you look at what he was talking about in the playoffs, um, when people were talking about like, you know, when Luca came back and you kind of went from being the focal point of everything to playing off the ball a lot and having to kind of change up how you were playing in the series how did how did you adjust to that like mentally and his answer was basically like look he's luka effing Doncic. like he's a generational player you're not going like he's here things are going to run through him but my job isn't to take away from him my job is to find a way to compliment him and to see where i can help the team and where i can fit in best here and you know i've i've found how to do that. And I've learned how to work off the ball more and how to take my opportunities as they come. That's really what it boiled down to. It was just a very, a very self-aware, uh, mature answer from a guy. Now I know he was in college for a long time and, you know, he's just now getting his first big NBA contract, but the, the maturity of his answer and everything was one of those things where it's like, man, that's more of a, like a grizzled veteran perspective. Usually, you usually hear that kind of perspective from a guy that's like in his early to mid thirties. And it's just like, look, man, I'm starting to think like big picture and just wanting to win a ring. So I'm all about doing what makes sense for the team. Like a Sean Marion coming to Dallas and uh, you know, then that 2010, 2011 season coming off the bench the entire year. Right. Having having gone from a guy that was like a primary facet of the offense and of a twenty point guy. everything, yes, a guy who in Phoenix had multiple All Star appearances and was a phenomenal, phenomenal player, swallowed his pride and came off the bench for pretty much that whole year until Butler obviously goes down. Karan Butler with the uh, dislocated knee and torn patella tendon. Uh, in January of that year. And then he just right. steps back in, but he never complained. But again, that was right. a guy that was like 33, 34 years old. Marion was at the time. That was the perspective. And Marion rightfully so was praised for that. You already see sort of similar maturity here from Jalen, I feel like. And that's, that's incredibly, that's a, a testament to him. You know, like that's very rare. And uh, that also leads me to believe like, he's not looking to cash out the biggest check he can. He just wants to, make sure that he's paid and respected paid like he's respected you know what i right. mean it's like, about respect it's yeah. not about like you overpaying me it's about you paying me respect just like i i'm just saying like at a job at your job mm-hmm. if you're at your job right and you busted your tail and you feel like you put in your work look i don't need you to go pay me crazy like a crazy number just give me a respectable number and we're good And like you said, I think the maturity is coming from Jalen where he's already doing that and understanding that. Uh, But when you look at Jalen and just listen to him talk, just his body language all the time, he looks mature. Obviously, we talked about his father was a coach. So that helps you. I feel mature as a young player growing up because you kind of already understand how the how the business goes in in a sense. So you already kind of grow up mentally more than other people have because they haven't seen it like you have. No, I, I agree hundred percent. So Jalen, 
I, I think it's more or less locked up. And even the Mavericks, as they've been doing their social media stuff, they're doing their various graphics and stuff of like Mavs pool parties and shit. They're still including Jalen in every uh, every illustration they do. So it's like, yeah, they're they're convinced. <laughs> They wouldn't be putting him in it. You know, he's an unrestricted free agent. They wouldn't be including him in it if they thought like, oh, exactly. there's a chance we might not get him. I'm convinced exactly. that the early report that we were hearing where he's basically like, look, it's not like a done, done deal, but like it's essentially a done deal. Right. I, that's that's where it's at as far as I'm concerned. So this isn't going to be a DeAndre Jordan thing where in the 11th hour and 59th minute. Uh, there's an intervention that leads to a change of heart. Right, this is right, him staying right. home, not him leaving and realizing only at the last minute, like, oh, God, I am making a terrible mistake. I am not the player they're going to pay me to be. And right. here I'm at least protected a little bit. Worst uh-huh. I got to deal with is getting bullied by Chris Paul. Right. So, yeah. So let's talk a couple of mid-level exception options here. Let's uh, talk about it, big dog. Yeah. So Throw some names out to me. I, I keep turning over in my mind different options for mm. Dallas here. And I've been scouring, you know, some of the, some of maps, Twitter as well, kind of reading the pulse a little bit right. and a couple of names stick out to me. Obviously one of them names we're going to know here. He's in the thumbnail on the screen. Now uh, you do have Gary Payton, the second, that's an intriguing one just because uh, golden state's about to pay, uh, pay pool. And he already uh, said he wants some, what? Almost what fifteen to twenty some million, something over like that? that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And they're about to pay pool like a mm. hundred million dollar contract. Yeah, like he's, extension. Pool's gonna get paid. Yeah, so they have no flexibility to to retain. I would love that second. addition. That would be now. Here's the thing with Dallas's uh, current ship. Now, their mid level exception. It's not the the most robust. One that you have out there. In fact, it's uh-huh. a three-year deal with each season being about six point three nine million. Uh-huh. So that's about a what three for 18, 19 roughly million dollar contract. Mm-hmm. That's not the that's not the sexiest. That's not going to draw people. To and give that, but yeah, to give context to that further, there are nine other teams with higher mid levels available. That's Charlotte, Chicago, Houston, Indiana, New York, Oklahoma City, Phoenix. By the way, Phoenix ahead of you, and that is. And he will go to one of those before Dallas. Portland and Toronto, and Portland just made a nice uh, acquisition tonight yeah, that I that. really, I, I, I like. I've that. been wanting Jeremy Grant for two or three years now. So and, yeah, and they're now they're going after a newbie as well from Toronto. So Portland's not yet giving up on the the Damian Lillard era. That's, I like that, though. I like how they're saying, you know what? We love you that much. We're going to continue to build, get players to make you stay. I, yep. I like that. I like an organization that does that because too many organizations are always quick to let players go or get rid of them. I like when organizations are like, hey, man, we love you. We don't want you to go nowhere, and we mm-hmm. will do whatever to keep you. I like that. I like it for Portland for sure. I hate it for what it means for the West just being that right because it's what about more difficult, right? Yeah, exactly. Um, yeah, so do it in the East. Yeah, for sure. <laughs> um, yeah, so with that mid level exception for Dallas, three for each season being 6.39 million, mm-hmm. uh, there that's including like a five percent raise in years two and three, respectively. So uh, it's not near as wow. That is quite the freeze frame I got on the video and OBS of me there. I look drunk as shit. Um, All right, we like drunk. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But uh, yeah, so Dallas is mid level exception. Not not the most impressive. They might be able to do something with it. It's interesting though, as you try and consider like how can you get into the market for some of these guys? Because we know Tim McMahon had said uh, in a in a interview on the ticket the other day. The Mavericks are still targeting a three and D wing with their mid-level exception. And I don't think you're going to be able to get um, Peyton at that, at that cost, especially not when we talked about some of these other teams, including teams like Phoenix right. who are in that uh, mix as well. Phoenix is really the only one of these teams I see that's like, Oh, there's your clear contender. Everyone right. else is kind of in that middle to lower rank, but mm-hmm. yeah. Um, so that's that's one that would be intriguing. He would fit certainly the role of what they want there, and I think he would be a tremendous addition. Another one that's very underrated um, is Isaiah Hartenstein. So he was with the Clippers last year. His numbers 
aren't going to blow you away when you hear the first couple, but the percentages are what I want you to look at. Okay. The dude averaged 8.3 points, 4.9 mm-hmm. boards, but he shot 62.6% from the field and 46.7% from three. I mean, three is the shoe. Uh, I don't have the full number ahead of me, like on pulled up here, but I can look it up real quick. Okay. But, uh, here's here's the thing he is a huge fit in terms of scheme like Mm -hmm. what he brings is a dynamic that would stretch the floor for dallas basically Mm -hmm. give you uh an even better version of what maxi is kind of bringing and his ability to stretch the floor here right uh let me see pulling it up now so he took let's see it's not that he takes a ton of threes. He's just very efficient. He's efficient. He's just very, efficient. very right, efficient. Right, with them. right, yeah. right. Yeah, I'm looking at basketball reference here, and it's like showing me his like attempts, three point attempts per game. It's like just show me how many he took for the season. That's all I'm really <laughs> asking you, dude. Uh, okay, he had thirty Don't attempts. When the, don't thirty when attempts. The computers that. Yeah, thirty attempts on the season made fourteen of them. So not bad. Um, yeah, forty six point seven percent from three a guy you can stretch the floor for you a little bit. Again, this is not a starter, but this is a guy who with a mid-level exception could be an intriguing possibility. He's also never made more than $2 million in a season. So he's never been paid. So he ain't going to be greedy. Right. And last year was his first year as a, uh, as a regular in the Clipper rotation. Mm. So there's not a lot of awareness of him. He's not like a, a commodity known around the league. And he's not made a lot of money, but he does have the ability to convert in an area that helps your team. So that's another one that's uh, an intriguing possibility to me that just, again, rounds out your front court depth a little bit. You're bringing in a big, a power forward center who can stretch the floor and be efficient and who you don't have to pay a lot of money. Right, right. Hey, well, you know what? I, I trust DDP and I listen to DDP. So we'll see what happens with that. I think uh, more the second option will be more of a viable option because, mm-hmm. like you said, Gary Payton the second. I mean, there's so many teams out there. He's going to understand his value now. Yeah. And these players now in the NBA do not undersell their value. They're going to get what they want mm-hmm. uh, because they have more uh, player control in the NBA. Um, so they're not just going to settle for any kind of thing because they don't have to uh, because the way they can, way they set up their contracts, they don't have to settle like maybe like for an NFL player. I feel like they have to settle more because yeah. the NFL will cut them off. And since the contracts are not guaranteed, they can play more hardball with them. Whereas in the NBA or even other teams, when their contracts are guaranteed, it changes the dynamic of how the negotiating goes. So I think uh, I definitely think Peyton won't be an option. But the second player that you did mention, I definitely think that could be happening, especially because of the money. You mm-hmm. haven't made a lot of money, so you ain't going to be tripping. And the scheme, it's a good scheme for you. And Jason Kidd, I like him. You may want to come over here and play for him as well. So I think three of those three things can make it happen as far as if that was an option for the Dallas Mavericks in the future. Let me throw another name at you here that you might be able to get with that. And it would fit again in your, your three and D wing sort of outlook. Mm -hmm. What would you think of Derek Jones jr? And he's athletic. He is an athletic freak pair him with Luca and you've got a major uh, aerial assault prime and ready to go. Now he's been bounced around a little bit well with Dallas. Yeah. He's bounced around a little bit, had a year in Phoenix, a couple years in Phoenix, uh, Miami for several years. And then he was Portland and Chicago last year. I think, uh, I think that could be an intriguing one as well. He's a guy who, uh, let me see his stats here last season, about 32, 33% from three, not a great three point shooter. Um, but you wouldn't really look at him in that aspect with Dallas. No, but his field you, goal percentage is about 54%. Right. So he's he's so giving you that. He's going to give you that. I'm not even looking at him as a three-point guy. I look at him as that athletic person that the Dallas Mavericks need. Mm-hmm. You understand Dallas needs a really super 
kind of bungee jumpy guy. You know what I mean? I feel like they need that. And I think he could bring that in the fold. I mean, you brought in Wood. He's a bouncy guy. But yep. you're bringing in Derrick Jones Jr. He, he's bouncy, bouncy. Yep. And, um, you know, Luca coming to the hole, throwing him up in the air, getting the crowd all in it. Number And you just mentioned the DDP. He's not he's not a have he's not a guy that's ever going to have a home. Let's no. keep it real. He's yeah. never going to have a home because he's that type of player that you don't need him, mm-hmm. but you can use him for a few years. That's the way it is. You know yep. what I'm saying? There's certain players in the NBA like that. That's what he is. So in that aspect, with the athletic side and defense, bring him in. He don't cost you a lot of money. Cause you know you're probably not gonna keep him for a long term. So get what you can out of him now. I think that'd be a great addition, especially with the athleticism. Because I feel like the Dallas Mavericks need a little bit more of that. I think he definitely fits like the the front court player uh, Hartenstein. Like he's he's a kind of bargain bin shopping thing. Like I think he would be an underrated pickup for his fit. But that that's one of those things that I think he's obtainable for like what you're looking at, but in terms of what we're hearing they're looking for and what could also still fit Jones jr. Is a fascinating possibility. I was hoping that they were going to do something with that $10.9 million trade exception, but it expires on June 27th. And according to Mark Stein, they're unlikely to use it. So I don't know. Uh, I don't know all the details of that, like what the reasoning is. Uh, that's a major bummer because that's not an asset that, feels like it should be wasted. It's basically a way to cancel out like when the money is not lining up in a trade, uh, a way to kind of create some of that wiggle room for you. Um, and I'm reminded too, like the uh, the Eric Dampier trade clause, essentially exception is what landed us Tyson ultimately. And then we it moved from us then to the Lakers when we traded for Lamar Odom in a separate thing. Um, There's just, I I followed this thread once before and basically figured out like a 12 step process of how it ultimately led to James Harden and the Rockets uh, and blew up the Oklahoma city perceived dynasty and everything. But uh, yeah, trade exceptions, Dallas recent track record has not utilized them well. They let the Richardson one, which is really the Seth Curry one, um, expire as well in that deal. And that was really frustrating to see. So I was hoping they were going to get use out of this. I read something that it's tied loosely to the wood trade because the wood trade can't be made official until the draft because New York owns the 2023 Dallas first round pick. So it's like until we get to that point of draft night, it doesn't actually go official. So that's kind of holding up the timing of some of this as well. So maybe maybe it is just a timing thing, but it's it's surprising to me that they would kind of give up on about eleven million dollars of free money essentially at this point. It's like you got a gift card, you know it's going to expire. Use it. Doesn't matter if it's not your favorite place to go eat. Go use it. You got a gift card. That's the whole point. Like you just said, it don't matter if it's your favorite place. It's free money. It's giving just you can go spend it. Don't matter what you do with it. Just go use it. So if you just got the opportunity, just go use it. Go out there and get something with it. Like you said, don't got to be tasty morsel. But is this something you can chew on and eat? So make that happen, big dog. Yep. Yeah. And, um, you know, it also would have helped you in the uh, as Dallas is trying to find a couple of these guys, like we know they're looking for a three and D wing. That's going to your mid-level exception. will give you some options there, but you got three open roster spots. Like you could have been, you could be a little more aggressive on that. You could plug two holes still at this point. Now I know some, some people are still trying to figure out how to do the mental gymnastics for like miles Turner. I don't see that. <laughs> I just don't, there's no, there's no way uh, at this point for it. And would it would it be a fascinating thing? Sure, but like Dallas, you know, they need a defensive minded rim protector and everything. Woods got the ability to stretch the floor, and he plays with such violent explosiveness. Which, I, honestly, like I knew his his athleticism and everything, but deep diving even further into his tape and everything the last week, I'm just like, good God, this man is going to be a monster in this offense. Like the kind of looks and setups he's going to get from Luca and the explosiveness he plays with, like surprising ferocity for a guy of his frame. 
Um, that's something that this team just has not had with Luca. Um, but you know, if you, if you were looking to do it, you could have had some options out there that I feel like now you're just kind of, if not letting go, you're missing out on an opportunity to, to make some upgrades. So Mavericks, I think for the most part to round out all of this talk here, I think the Jalen Brunson extension that is highly expected is more or less the one bit of wheeling and dealing they got left. We've seen reports that they are trying to trade back into the late first round. Um, and they've even worked out a couple of prospects and everything that they're still trying to figure out if there's a way they can get back up into that. It, here's, here's my hot take. The, so I said the wood take isn't final yet. I think it's going to be modified and I think we're going to have either another team brought in or you're going to see Josh green packaged as part of a deal that gets Dallas back into the first round for uh, one of the prospects that they were looking at. So any, you might have your day yet with all those prospects you broke down, but I think, uh, I think this deal gets modified and Josh green is uh, moved on from. Yeah, I definitely feel like, you know, Josh green, he's the dangling bait. We all know that he's probably not going to be there long-term. We all feel it in our hearts and our souls. And that would be the one dangling piece that you can really move. Cause you don't know, he's really going to have the trajectory of being a guy that's going to be with the Mavericks the next three, four or five years. So mm-hmm. you know, that's just what it is, but Hey, there it is. But let's jump on some Cowboys football, man. You know you what I'm go. saying? Let, let's jump on that because hey, training camps right around the corner. Mm-hmm. We camp wrapped up. I'm going to be heading to training camp the first week of August. So let's talk about some Dallas Cowboys football. DDP. Yes. I'm yes. I'm. So I want to give some quick observations when we jump right into it, right? Some things I want to look at, and I'm going to have you kind of bounce off, you know, kind of my thoughts going into training camp, uh, kind of my thoughts going into training camp. Um, you know, first off the bat, you know, one of the things that I want to be looking at at camp, obviously, when you listen to Jerry Jones, he just had an interview, DDP, and he was talking mm-hmm. about the young players. Young players are a lifeline. It's all on these young players. They don't do it. Then we're going to be in a world of hurt. Mm -hmm. So that to me puts a lot of pressure on, especially the first four draft picks. You had Jalen Tolbert. I mean, I'm not saying he's the first pick. You had Tyler Smith. You had Sam Williams, Jalen Tolbert, um, Jake Ferguson. Yeah. (laughs) Those four players, in my opinion, are going to have to have big roles their first year Mm -hmm. because of how dependent on, the Cowboys and Stephen Jones, not so much Jerry. Yeah. But Stephen Jones, that's his philosophy of messing with these draft players. I said, that is going to be key, you know, in their development, heading into camp. Kind of what's your thoughts on that, man? Because the way I see it from that aspect of those first four picks, the way it was last year with Oga Dezua, Parsons, those guys, these four guys will have to come in like almost like gangbusters. I almost feel like it's kind of unfair the way they put them in that in that realm of, Mm -hmm. hey, it don't matter if you're rookies, you got to come in and produce because they've never seen this. And you're putting all this onus on young players to get you to the chip. I kind of have a problem with that because I don't know if your guys you have there are the type of guys that can take you to the chip. No, it's it's uh, it's entirely unfair to ask and even expect that of it. And I, I think the the Parsons thing kind of skewed the perception a little bit like even if it's just like the recency thing like oh see like now that with the proper coaching and if you have a really good talent you can overcome it and you can be an immediate impact player like oh look we even had uh diggy was making big plays for us early in the year and you know look what the coaching was able to bring out in year two from trayvon Diggs. like they, they look at all those things and like i get that but at the same time it's not super typical to plug in, like you said, like four, your first four picks of the current rookie class and have all of them contribute at a high level. Now, I even even without having heard the, the Jerry uh, quote that you were referencing there, I already felt like the first two picks for sure. Um, Smith and uh, Williams were in that situation where they were going to be asked to do a lot this year. I mean, 
we're looking at and he's in the thumbnail here tyron smith uh man i just don't the wheels are falling off like they they are falling off i was already expecting um the first pick you know for him to get a lot of a lot of work at swing tackle and them having to figure out a way to kind of bring him along quickly because i just anticipate at this point that tyron's gonna miss four or five games per year it just feels like that, especially now that we're extending the season an extra game each week or each year. Um, so yeah, it's, it's definitely going to have that, but now with some of these other moves they've made, the Cowboys, they're basically saying, Hey, we've, we've let some of this depth go. Some of these guys that could have made up for it now, you know, like, Oh, how would, how would you be putting more pressure on, uh, your your rookie pass rusher in this case by letting like an Amari Cooper go, for instance. Well, if the offense is just a little bit less dynamic and now instead of having uh, an A plus grade offense, you might have an A minus B plus something like that. And so maybe you're not scoring quite as much. Maybe you're not able to extend drives quite as much. That's going to put the pressure then on the defense. That's why a defense's best friend is a good run game. Right. Similar here, like you're putting more pressure on these guys by other decisions you've made, even if it's not at their exact position. And so you were already putting that pressure on them. And now to, to have this situation where you essentially got four of these guys, three or four of these guys, at least in that situation, it, it's a really tough spot to put these kids in. Hopefully they're able to kind of rise to the occasion. I imagine that they'll do all right, but I do anticipate growing pains. I know that I thought that there was going to be growing pains for Micah Parsons and there wasn't really, but that is very much the exception and not the rule. So we'll see. It's a, it's a major gamble. I don't agree with Dallas taking it the way they have, but they made their bed. They're going to either have to lie in it or get away with it and take the money to the bank, you know, take the money and run. I mean, honestly, it's the Stephen Jones way. It's yep. not the Jerry Jones way. This is the Stephen Jones way, and that's where we can say more Stephen Jones has taken over this organization than Jerry. Jerry's about to be 80 years old. Mm-hmm. He's, you know, he's in his later years. Um, so Stephen Jones is going to be the successor. So I feel like Jerry is more taking a back seat to him and kind of let him feel his way. And Stephen Jones, you know, we know what he's about. He's about being not spending a lot of money in free agency, banking on these rookies and keeping the players you have. So, um, you know, that type of philosophy, I don't hate on it. Uh, but you know, the thing to me is once again, it's funny how you put you gamble on rookies who've never played in the NFL, but you won't gamble on a free agent who right. has done it, been there and done it, who has proved it around these guys in the NFL and has done it, but because he wants a little bit more money, mm-hmm. you're not gonna do it. And you go with a young player who hasn't shown you anything. But because he's cheap, you're willing to bake on that. That's the type of philosophy I don't like. Yeah, no, I, I agree 100%. Um, and it just, it, it feels like you're taking an unnecessary risk. It, it's not a situation where we, we've said this before, that like the money you're saving, you're not rolling it over into a future into a future thing where it's like, okay, you're not we have, putting it to a superstar. You're yeah. Just, yeah. You're not investing it elsewhere. You just, you're saving that money and like, Oh, well, we want to be flexible. Well, it's like, if you're flexible, then you're, you're making a move to go get something like you're, you're holding on to some money. If it's your rainy day fund, well, then you're going to go spend it when it makes sense to go spend it. Like you're going to go acquire a guy, uh, sign a guy that can make a big difference to your team. And they didn't do that. And there were so many of these guys that were floating out there. This was one of the more active. It felt like NFL off seasons. There were so many guys out there that would have been like, Hmm, he would be, he would be good for this defense, especially with some of these uh, departures they've had. This would be a good way to kind of reinforce and okay. They're not even going to try. Hmm. Okay. Well, (laughs) I don't know. I don't know what we're doing here. Like, why are we doing this? And uh, it, it just felt like a series of those kind of moves where it's like, they think they're playing 4d chess and 
I still feel like they're playing checkers. That, see, the problem is <laughs> they, they, they think, think they're, they're outsmart. They're... Stephen Jones thinks he's outsmarting everybody. That's his problem. See, he thinks he's outsmarting everybody by doing mm-hmm. it this way, and he's trying to prove to everybody we can win this way the way I'm doing it. We can win this way. No, it ain't because conservative don't win. I right. don't care what anybody tells me. I ain't never seen where conservative wins and win consistently. No, it does not. When you have a conservative mindset and conservative behavior, you are not winning consistently. No, you're not in anything, not in life, not in, not in, not in, not in sports, Uh not in work, not in anything. When you're just a super conservative person, you're not the one that's going to be taking over and winning the business and being the top dog. No, you're not. You're going to be a middling person. You won't be the worst. You won't be the best. Mm -hmm. You'll be right in that middle. You'll be in that middle where you're competitive, but you won't ever reach the top. And that's the truth. And that's what is with Dallas. And so here's the thing. We get so many people fooled thinking because what Stephen Jones is doing with these young players, it keeps us in the loop because we keep we get excited because young players get you excited. They do. Mm -hmm. Young players get you excited. And that's what he plays on. But at the end of the day, that conservative mindset never gets you over the hump but i'll leave that alone because i always jump on that i okay. i'm curious um i'm trying to think and not to like put you on the spot i'm trying to think of an example of a recent super bowl champion that was pretty conservatively built and i'm, I'm hard pressed like obviously not the rams obviously not the the chiefs not the bucks uh not the patriots not the patriots not the eagles not the falcons like, the Patriots would have probably been the closest closest example I can think of to, to one but of those. But they still would go out and make mm-hmm. a trade midseason. If they felt like they were falling off or they needed a little yep. jolt, they would make the trade in the midseason. Mm-hmm. Patriots had no problem making trades, getting rid of draft picks, and picking up a player and giving away a couple of draft picks midseason if they felt like that player can get them over the hump to take them to the Super Bowl. Patriots yeah. had no problem doing that. And that's just the truth. And – I, you, we can look through history. You building it through a conservative mindset is not going to be a consistent winner every single year. And you're not going to the Super Bowl every single no, year. You're not no. Be, no, you're not going to do it. No, you're not. No, I'm, you're going to win games. Here's the thing. You'll win games, DDP. You'll win maybe nine, ten games. You'll be right. competitive. You'll win games, but you ain't never going to get over the hump. Let's see. Yeah, let's see the Cowboys win ten games in back-to-back seasons for the first time let's since see. like 95, 96 right. or whatever it is. Let's see yeah. back-to-back NFC champions in, since in twenty years. Let's see. I mean, let's see one of those. But less. But less. <laughs> yeah. But yeah. less. I, I agree. I agree. Let's see. Um, <laughs> Prove. Show me. Show me. Show me, Stephen and Jerry. With less, now y'all gonna do more. Okay. Right. Y'all have more, and then y'all did less. Mm-hmm. Now y'all gonna have less. You are gonna do more. With the current state that y'all have, I'm sorry, I don't believe that. Addition by subtraction is a real thing, but it has to be like a case where addition by subtraction would be like not having Jason Witten at age 39 or whatever playing tight end for you and blocking the development of other guys. Right, that that would be addition through subtraction, not hey, we're going to make our receiving core worse. Now, here's the thing. I like uh, Tolbert that they that they got right. the kid in the third right. round. Like, I like what I see He's from him. He's still a rookie. Yeah, I, I like that. But I also look at it and say, like, if your mindset was to go win it all now, you don't do Put that. It on a rookie. Right. You don't because... say if you were trying to go to a Super Bowl, you don't say we're putting it on a third round South Alabama rookie. Right. And, and think about it, too, this way. Like, Gallup's coming back off of the ACL in, anyway. So um, you got him coming back. He's going to miss the first part of the season and everything. Um, you could have still had Amari, CD, and uh, your, your rookie receiver here. And then Gallup would come back at some point and he would be your insurance policy one way or the other. Like you still had the ability to do all of this. That's why it doesn't make sense to me to say like, oh, well, we knew that we could just go draft a, a new receiver and that would that would bridge that gap it's like you can have overlap it makes sense especially uh to have overlap if you're trying to bring a rookie along you don't want to throw them into the fire in that situation and with the departure of cedric wilson it, isn't even more dynamic made, when you got a it rookie it makes hell of sense you can't put more and you still could have drafted that rookie mm-hmm. you didn't have to get deal him you still would have been in the same draft position now you add a Jalen Tolbert 
for losing a Cedric Wilson. You got a young guy on a contract for at least four years who's a fourth round pick, a mm-hmm. third round pick. You ain't paying him a lot of money. So now you have fun with him for the next at least two, three years. You understand what I'm saying? Yep. No, Stephen Jones. Yeah, no, I don't like how Mario was acting. He didn't want to take his COVID test and he didn't want to get blah, blah. So now we're going to punish him and we ain't going to spend that money. And then every time I'm being the media, I'm going to say all this fake stuff. Man, I'm going to tell you right now, I had to repent to Jerry Jones, mm-hmm. uh, DDP. Uh, I wasn't saying, you know, Jerry, what are you doing? Jerry would just frustrate me. Okay, mm-hmm. and I just said we weren't winning another title on Jerry, and I said a lot of Jerry, so I apologize, Jerry. It's Steven. Yeah. Okay, I'm sorry, Jerry. I apologize. I know you 80, but your son about to ruin the Cowboys. <laughs> it's kind of like about to uh, ruin them. It's kind of making me think here about uh, just wanting the Al Davis motto here, like just win, just win, baby. Like don't don't mix it up with all these personal feelings and all of these frustrations and rivalries and stuff like just put a winning product on the field go put the best team together that you can we know that they've done it before look how many times in the past and i'm not advocating for them to do this by the way i'm just saying in the past they had that like oh do whatever makes the team better mentality they would bring in guys that were you know domestic violence guys guys that had like gun charges and stuff against them like pac-man tank johnson over the edge um, guys who's the dude from carolina who literally had to serve like a six game suspension or something like that right out of the gate he's not he was in the nfl like only that year and then he went to mma uh oh greg Hardy. yes greg hardy um yeah, yeah yeah like we know that they've got that in them to like be like, look, dude, we're just we don't care about this other stuff. We're just gonna go. But try that was play. Jerry though, DDP. That's the thing. That was the Jerry in yeah. him because Jerry didn't care. Jerry didn't care who it was. I'm trying to win a championship, so I'm gonna bring in whatever, sure. whoever. I'm trying to win a championship. Steven is the polar opposite of him. He's like, no, we don't want to do that. We don't want to bring in those type of people. Uh-huh. We don't want to bring out that care. We want to have these type of guys. We we'll have this. Bro, that's Eating, not gonna it work. sounds very Jason Garrettism. We want the oh, right kind Jason of guys. Jason Garrett all day because when uh my guy Mike Mike um uh, from Burgers and Blitzes no, no from Burgers and Blitzes I was uh, like Mike's please don't quote from, Fisher no I will never do that <laughs> Mike White from Burgers and Blitzes he's told me and this was he said his sources were strong he said Jerry Wonderfy J- Jason Garrett right after the L A Rams whooped up on Dallas 2018 yeah he wanted to fire him Mm -hmm. it was Stephen Jones that said no dad we can't do that right now and he saved Garrett you understand I'm saying Mm -hmm. it's like he's saving Kellen Moore it's Stephen dog Stephen has neutered Jerry Jones and now he's neutered and Stephen Jones is running this and I don't care I know we hate to hear this Cowboys fans I know you won't don't want to hear this okay because I'm not Nostradamus we ain't winning nothing under Stephen Jones yeah no, it's uh, you basically just give Jerry a, a constant, a constant feed of Johnny Walker Blue, and that'll yeah. that'll tame him down just enough. Sedate yeah, him. yeah, yeah. <laughs> Hook it up to the IV, but uh, <laughs> yeah, no, it's it's definitely, it's definitely questionable how they're operating things. And again, I'm not saying like they need to go get a bunch of these like right. unruly guys. I'm just saying like in the past. They very much were like, oh, I don't. Wh- what are you charged with? We'll do whatever yeah. to win. What are you charged with? Oh, you might have a couple game suspension. All right. Well, can you help my team win now? All right. Well, right. Here, well, let's bring you in, or let's see if we can bring you in. They would do stuff like that. I mean, dang the the Greg Hardy thing. They literally signed him knowing he was going to have some kind of suspension, and initially it was going to be a, a ten game. Signing. Right. Initially it was going to be a ten game suspension, and you know that was the only time where they were like, ooh. 10 games. If we had known that, maybe we would have reconsidered and it ended up getting uh, reduced down to like six or four or something like that. Yeah, yeah like four. Yeah. Uh, ridiculous. But even still, it's just like they've they've shown that mentality. And somewhere suddenly in the last two or three years, as the power dynamic has shifted more towards Steven pulling all the strings, it seems it, it's just completely gone. This was this off season was nothing. We don't, we don't have any kind of edginess with There's this no team. urgency. This team is bland. There's no sense of urgency because Stephen Jones says we want to do it this way. And yeah. if this takes uh five, 10 years to do it, <laughs> then we're more than happy to do it. 
That's what I feel he's saying to us, dog. Without him saying it, he's mm-hmm. saying, hey, I don't care how long it takes. You know why? Because ain't nobody telling me to rush me. Ain't right. nobody rushing me. There's nobody in there telling them, DDP, hey, you don't get this done this year. You're fired. Is yeah. he firing Stephen Jones? Right. No, that's uh that's a good point. It's it's the biggest thing that's missing from this team. And Jerry, even if he was wheeling and dealing and gambling and making uh, very questionable decisions like $50 million for Brandon Carr, at the very least, he was aggressive and pushing. When you got a guy that's just sitting there doing nothing and you're sitting there seeing your team either gradually get worse or basically just saying like, dude, you got to hit on the draft every single year and you got to hit on like quality contributors for like six or seven guys. Cause otherwise we're going to, we're going to run thin. We're going to run out and we're not going to have enough firepower and depth to actually offset these other questionable decisions we're making. And I'm not even saying that like, Oh, well we know, cause we know they like, Oh, we like our guys. We like to, keep our talent, retain our talent. And how many guys did they have that were paid in like the top three or four at their position until recently? I know a couple of them have slipped off now as new deals have gone around the league, but it's just like, I hate that mentality where it's like, you got like, all right, we're going to have like five or six guys at the very top of the roster. We're going to pay them all like the very top of their positions and everything else basically has to be veteran minimum type stuff or, um, or rookie contracts essentially. Like that's not, that's not a balanced enough way to build your team. You're too top heavy. You don't have it. You either have a bunch of young guys that are inexperienced or last year was almost the perfect storm. You brought in a bunch of guys who were kind of castaways from other teams. And most of them worked out for you very well. What is why I will not get over last season and how it ended. You had the perfect storm of depth, talent, health, and actual playmakers on both sides of the ball. And the fact that you basically set it adrift out to sea and then launched a flaming arrow at your own future makes no damn sense to me. Like, I I can't fathom it. It, It'd be one thing to have that bitter of a taste and knowing they were at least going to come back and be aggressive. I could could maybe cope with that. I, I still would be skeptical, but I could cope with it. Everything they're doing has has just completely burned me like to the point where I'm like, I don't have any trust in how they're being run. I don't have any real faith in their decision-making or anything like that. Like McClay's drafting. That's about all that I can bank on at this point. Like even when they make questionable picks, I'm just like, because if we didn't have Will McClay, Dallas would be a four and 12 team every single year. And it might be better because at least they'd have a top end pick. It wouldn't matter because you got Steven Jones. I know. I'm, oh, yeah. Or they well, would don't do, matter. Or they would it do the same matter. thing they did before where they took yeah. Zeke instead of uh, yeah. Ramsey. <laughs> it, it doesn't matter, dog. As long as you got him, conservative self, doing what he's doing, we can talk about this all day, all night. We got mm-hmm. Michael Parsons, right? I guarantee you Michael Parsons went somewhere else and played for a doggish team, begin chips. Yeah, probably. Okay? he begin chips. And the only reason why, you know, you know, it's sad because Dallas has so much talent just coming through the building mm-hmm. and it's going to keep getting wasted because of that conservative self. So, yep. you know, it is what it is for sure. Yeah. So I feel like we got on to a depressing rant there at the end, but that's, I mean, it is. I, I mean, I don't even want to talk about nothing now. else. Yeah. I don't even <laughs> want to talk about it. It's like, I don't even want to talk about nothing else now with Dallas. <laughs> I, I killed the show. I no, mean, you we, didn't we, kill it. We it's were basically real. wrapping up it's, anyway. It's, it, it, we were about wrapping it up anyway, but it's just to me, it's the real. I don't want to talk the mumbo jumbo with Dallas sure. no more, DDP. I don't want to talk the mumbo jumbo. I don't want to talk the fake stuff with Dallas. I'm not talking that fake stuff with Dallas. This is the reality of the Dallas Cowboys. Mm-hmm. They're not winning, and they're not winning no time soon. Now, understand what I'm saying. They're going to win games. They're going to win nine, ten games. They're going to win games. Mm-hmm. Like I said, conservative approach, you will win games. How they're building it. They will win games, but they are not going to get over the hump. And it's going to be just enough DDP to keep these fans keep coming back. It's going to be just enough to pull them back in when they get so frustrated and mad and say, I'm done with Dallas. They're going to do just enough to pull them right back in because that's what's happening now. Right? Because me and you just talked about 
I'm not over that 12 and five season. Yeah. I'm not over last year. I still think about it. Mm -hmm. I am not over it because there is no way in hell that should have happened. Right. No, I I agree. I mean, think, just think about the entirety of Romo's career and then moving straight into deck. How many years alone does that span? So Romo took over in 06. So 06 to 22, (laughs) we're talking about what, 16 years, 18 years, like absurd, absurd. And yet here we are and we don't even have a championship game appearance because of how janky ass building of our roster we've done because of how we didn't build an offensive line and got Romo killed basically for four years straight until his body completely broke down. Right. As you were kind of on the cusp, like I Dak in 2016 was sensational as a rookie, but part of me will wonder, man, if we hadn't gotten Romo killed for like three of the past four years going into that, I wonder what 2016 would have looked like with Romo and Zeke and the rest of those guys. Or how about if they, you know, here's the thing. Okay. Now we see how Dak is, right? Dak Mm -hmm. is a, he's by the books guy, right? Mm -hmm. He ain't never trying to ruffle no feathers. So in hindsight now, why didn't they play Romo in the playoffs? Because Dak would have easily took a backseat to it because he would have known I'm the future. I'm not tripping yeah. off of this. Go ahead, Romo. Take this. See, now we see how Dak Prescott is because I feel like Dak wouldn't have tripped off that because he understood he was a rookie and Romo was the man. I held it down for you. Take over. I'll be there. I feel like Dak would have been like that. So in hindsight, you could have played Romo in them playoffs. He was healthy enough to do it. And in at the end of the day, he still wasn't going to have three or four more years playing with the Dallas Cowboys. No. We knew Romo was going to get hurt again. Mm-hmm. So it was going to be over anyway. So. You know, but it's, that's there goes one of my lights. <laughs> ah! um, yeah, no, it's uh, that, that's a valid point for sure. And we know in the case of um, of Romo that, yeah, he Jerry was the last one holding out hope for that. Jerry was literally going. We were practically going into like the last couple of weeks of the season before the playoffs. And Jerry was still talking about like, wouldn't it be a great story if Romo came back just in time for the playoffs and led us to a Super Bowl. Like he was still entertaining it. That might have been like the turning point of when Steven essentially won the argument, got the way with the pivot, and then just it stayed. And I was very much at on uh on team Dak at that point, just like, look, dude, you can't have this guy come in and do everything he's done. You can't have the team rally around right, him right, and respond right. to him to the point I, where even Dez like that too. To like the point where too. even Dez is saying, like, nah, man, like, it's it's Dak. You can't mm-hmm. have that and then turn around and be like, all hey, right, Romo. Tony, come come out here and take over. Like, you can't change the uh, the engineer. If it's a train, you can't change out your engineer uh, at that point. Maybe that's a terrible analogy because a train's on no, a not, fucking no, track. No, not really because, like I said, <laughs> what, what's a more Romo complicated always, thing to steer? Tony Romo always lacked the leadership part. He yeah. always he had talent, but he lacked the leadership that Dak did, and everybody gravitated toward that because obviously they were missing that in the locker room because they said Romo was aloof. Yeah, you know, he just played the game and went home, and kicked it with his peoples, and he ain't mess with nobody else. And when you're the quarterback, I don't care, dog. You can't do that. You mm-hmm. can't be a quarterback of a team, especially Dallas Cowboys, throw for four, four hundred some yards or whatever, whatever, and just go to the crib and don't talk to nobody. People are gonna be looking at you like, "What the hell is wrong with this dude?" Right? They are. Right. Yeah. So, the the point of all that was just the Cowboys haven't really been serious about capitalizing on the talent they've had, and they've had the talent they have had in the last fifteen years has been staggering at some of these positions and the fact that you wasted all of the Romo era and aren't doing a great job really investing properly in the DAC era is concerning, like Mm -hmm. really concerning. So we'll see. I'd say they figure it out, but uh, they're not, they're not going to figure it out. No, no. I mean, Steven, Steven, it's not like Steven's new to this job, right? He's right. been he's here. Been he's there. been he's been there. He he's watched it. He's, seen he's it. He knows built it. his There's philosophy no and he, he's yeah. set in his ways. Yeah. yeah. It, just... I'd, it'd be one thing if it's like, all right, well, we brought in this GM and, you know, eh, he's not really 
he's kind of picking it up as he goes. That'd be one thing. You're like, uh, that seems like a bad hire, but at least he can grow into it and maybe figure out like, okay, let me reevaluate and be self-aware. I don't see that with Steven. So we'll see. Just, I, and, we're going in circles. <laughs> yeah, I feel you. Well, and, and, and when we end it with this, I just want to say this. Jerry would have known he'd have fired anybody else with the job that he was doing. Yeah, 100%. Not even a question. <laughs> <laughs> I think he even I think he even acknowledged that in an interview at some point. Like, all right, if you had a general manager all this time and this was his record in 25 years in his resume, would you have kept him around? And he basically was like, he gets it. He was basically like, well, no, but I'm in this case, I'm the general manager. Right. So I'm yeah, obviously I'm not, not gonna fire myself. myself. <laughs> right. Yeah. Yeah. It's like, yeah, no, it, it's a double standard, but it's me. Like, what am I going to do? Fire me? No, it's my, it's my play things. It's my team, my franchise. I do whatever I want with it. So yeah, it's a painful life and existence of a Cowboys uh, fan. They, they sold their soul for the dynasty of the nineties. Jerry did. And uh, we are, man, at some point that's got it. You would just think statistically, <laughs> At some point, it's got to swing back your way, but uh, who knows how long that's going to be? Because I wouldn't have expected a quarter century. I can't. I, I really came into to watching this every week in like oh two, oh three. I was like, oh man, pff, should be like in the next few years, right? Nah, man. <laughs> I'm I'm thirty two. I'm thirty two, and I'm just like, uh, can I just see a conference championship game? Like, <laughs> yeah, you came in in the dark ages with Dave Campo. Yeah. Yep. Yep. This is yeah, tough. You, you might be a true Cowboys fan if you came in the dark ages. You still here? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I, I basically picked my favorite NFL team when I was like 11, and I've been mad about it ever since. Huh. <laughs> Letting it ruin my life ever since. But uh, that's life, I guess. It is what it is. But hey, man, another great episode, man, for Positively yeah. Relentless, episode nine in the books. More Mavericks talk. Jalen Brunson, Cowboys training camp. Make sure y'all check us out. Uh, like I said, I'll be down at uh, training camp at the first week of August. I'll uh, make sure we get some live good takes out there and see what these young rookies are looking like. Dak Prescott, they said he's in shape, Bendy. We'll see all that. And then they Tony Pollard might be in the slide. We'll, we'll see all the stuff that they've been talking about. We'll see if it actually happens. So make sure you check on that. And uh, make sure you stay tuned. Draft is coming up. You know, will Draft the Dallas is tomorrow night. Right. You know what I'm saying? So will the Mavericks get anybody else? Is this it? So a lot of storylines that's going to be coming up. So make sure you continue to keep on tuning in for Positively Relentless. We're going to keep on growing this thing. So for you myself, build. DDP, Dallas Prospect, Big Game James, man, we out and we're going to be talking to you soon. Peace. Peace.